Thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Andrew Greenberg. I am the chair of the Georgia Game Developers Association and as such work with some great VR developers here in Georgia. And uh, one thing that we have had to deal with games for a long time are concerns about the ethics of what we do in what we do, how we do them, and so on and so forth. And very happy with the VR development that is happening here in Georgia. Basically, most of this, uh, most of this team is, uh, is local, with one exception. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, I really love the diversity of this group and the work that they do, so I'm going to hand it off to them to start talking about exactly what kind of crazy things they're doing, and then we'll get into the ethical concerns. Uh, generally, I love an interactive panel, but for this one, I'd like to go through the panelists a bit, and then we'll start opening the floor more to questions. If you have a question absolutely burning through your brain, raise your hand, and one of these fine people on the outside will bring you the speaking box. And uh, <laughs> please don't go without the speaking box, because then we won't have it on. The various streams, uh, that will try not to record you as audience. That one probably will catch you as audience. That's the official EFF recording there. We are doing this one for the Georgia Game Developers Association channel, so you can follow us on YouTube with that. And so with that, to my left. Oh, wait, you've got a mic. I don't like this mic. Mine's better. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. Uh, my name is Dean Velez. I'm the creative director of Sprocket Creative. Uh, we've been doing uh, VR storytelling for two years now, so we've been doing it every day. Christian just said three years. Uh, so technically in the VR world, someone said we're experts. <laughs> 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 if you made two VR projects, you were an expert. Yeah, but you're old guard, and you don't know anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that uh, we've done, we've done a couple of things for t Turner Classic Movies. We did Noir Alley, which is a seven episode uh, VR whodunit. We've done a couple of things for Cartoon Network, um, Georgia Pacific, Change Healthcare, and a lot of internal stuff in so far as sci-fi, horror, and currently we're working on some dinosaurs uh, for some museums. So that's what we do. The main thing where, where it comes into the ethics, we started on a board game called Chimera's Rift, and we went to Momocon to show that, and we realized there was stuff we didn't understand and we didn't know when it comes to uh, the ethics of VR. Uh, my name is Dave Moss. I am, oh, do you want an applause for him first? Yay! <laughs> He's the only one who gets applause. We're just going to burn through so we have questions. <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Moss. I am a senior investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which means most of the time I investigate the police and the people who sell things to police. Uh, one of the things, you're just like looking at me like I'm weird. <laughs> one of the things I've done. Yeah, that gets applause. <laughs> one of the things I've done on the side is I have uh, helped EFF spend some time looking at some of the issues related to privacy with VR. But uh, as they say on Comedy Bang Bang, I have a little bit of an exclusive for tonight. Uh, we have been working on a small VR project ourselves called Spot the Surveillance, which is aimed to help people. Uh, you know, it's a small, short thing, but the idea is that you're put into an environment, uh, a street environment, and are looking for the pieces of surveillance in the community around you and identifying what they are and learning about them. And so uh, we have that uh, to demo at our table on this floor. It's over on the second floor, over kind of that way, I think. Um, but feel free to stop by tomorrow if you want and check it out. That gets applause. I'm Jesse Jacobson with Games That Work. Uh, we've been using game technologies to change people's behaviors for since 2001, so 17 years now. Uh, we moved into the VR space, uh, I'm gonna say in 2015, because that makes us sound good, but I honestly <laughs> don't know. You must be an expert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, had, uh, AR, we have an augmented reality game for uh, iPhone and Android called Brush Up that teaches children to brush their teeth. We ported that game to the Vive uh, and brought it to DC at, for a showcase of learning games where I'm happy to say that among 80 games, we won first prize. Hey. Woo. Uh, we, hey. Thank you. <laughs> uh, then we came back the next year with a game designed to teach healthy eating habits, just trying to get people to drink less soda, even though we are in Atlanta. <laughs> um, our original job was working for Coca-Cola. We are paying back that moral debt forever. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we did not win a prize that year, but they awarded no prize, so I'm going to claim we tied among 80. <laughs> uh, my name's Stephanie Turgi. I worked with Jesse on both of those games. 
Uh, one thing he didn't mention is that one of the, I guess, sort of issues that we ran into is we didn't do a lot of research on recommendations for children and VR before we did a VR game for children, and it's actually not recommended that people under 12 use VR, but I think that's for a lot of CYA reasons. Um, but uh, so one thing that uh, about the toothbrush and VR game, though, is that it was very short, so we thought that made it better <laughs> for... But think of the children. Yes, yeah, think of the children. <laughs> Um, my current focus is on user experience design in addition to my ex past experiences working with, on VR with Jesse. Hello everybody, I am Sean Shepard. I'm with Motion Reality. I'm the lead game developer there. Uh, the company was founded originally back in 1984. Um, as biomechanics, now we're motion reality. It kind of stands for motion capture and virtual reality. So uh, we've been doing some pretty interesting uh, large scale tetherless virtual reality with real time motion capture, um, mainly for military and law enforcement applications, but we're, we're uh, easing our way into and trying to kind of steamboat our way through, I guess you could say, to location based entertainment with virtual reality. Um, so we're currently deployed out with the product called Dauntless, which is for, like I said, military and law enforcement. Um, it's where you can get up to 12 folks in up to 5,000 square foot uh, volume being motion captured live uh, with weapon simulations, you know, clearing houses and stuff like that. So that's out in the world. It's a CryEngine based implementation. We're working on uh, replacing that with the Unity 3D implementation and uh, getting some more interesting stuff out there that entertainment uh, folks would appreciate a lot and be able to access uh, from a public standpoint. And boy, is it fun. <laughs> All right, so the focus of this panel is on ethics in VR, but these are some very talented VR developers. So if there are questions on VR development uh, and the like, we're glad to get into those during the question and answer part point, so don't be afraid to raise those, and especially on issues like UI and the rest. But first of all, when we're talking about ethics in, uh, in any of these areas, the first thing we usually have to do is focus on what is the audience for what you're doing. Part of the reason I love this panel is their audiences are very different, going from uh, Dean with the general entertainment audience. I wasn't aware of the EFF product before, but that's for everybody in this room. Because it's exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> Games that work going with children and Sean going with people who want to shoot each other in the head. So, a uh, very different group of demographics. So, I'd like to go down the line and just, if you could talk briefly about your target audience and what sort of considerations that brought up right off the bat. We're going this way. Right down the line. Okay. Um, so, our target audience uh, was actually younger. We, we st we're still debating what that age is. I'm sitting and saying our target audience is 16 ab and above. Uh, Christian, um, who's the co-creator of the game, is saying 14 and above. He's wrong. Uh, he's, he's never been a father. Um, so the whole point of it, and the, and the reason I personally uh, went to that two more years is just um, the ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy. But uh, it is across the board for, for everyone. Um, it's low on violence, but there are some spooky things that happen and there's some mature matter. Uh, there's no sex. Can we say that on your show? <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's after 10. <laughs> it's after 10. But there's, there's, there's some uh, spooky stuff, but we actually try and make sure that we don't do blood and guts, and everything that we do is more anxiety-driven uh, than uh, fear-driven. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out, you know, this is a, a first-time project for us, so we're not fully sure where we're going with it. I think that in my mind, we are looking at uh, people who live in urban areas who may or may not have, uh, you know, encounters with police on a regular basis, and hopefully putting them in a scenario where they are able to, in what would be maybe a stressful situation where they're not noticing the stuff around them, to be able to have a moment where they're doing it in virtual reality so they're able to see this is a cop scenario, this is like, you know, something going on, and being able to do it in a safe place so that maybe if there is a police stop later, they are able to like identify what's there, what they saw, so that if they need to talk to their lawyers about it, they're able to say, okay, I saw this surveillance camera, I saw this body camera, I saw this biometric device. So we chose children primarily because 
uh, it was the problem we were trying to solve is br proper brushing habits. And the f we were told by experts that in four, the four to six year old age range is the time that we can really change children's behavior in a lifelong way. And so we started there. I, earlier than that, they don't have the physical capabilities to manipulate a toothbrush well enough that parents need to help. Uh, older than that, their, their pattern, their habits start getting ingrained. So for us, it was much more once we defined the problem, the audience pretty much defined itself. Um, we had a second audience, which was anyone who was going to hire us to do the next project. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so we had to make sure that it was going to be fun for adults as well. Um, but th that's how we chose that. Yeah, and um, some of the considerations with children, I kind of joked about it earlier, uh, but particularly with VR and children at a young age, there's a lot of questions about how they're developing both physically and mentally at such a young age, um, how their eyes are developing. They're just unknowns about having, having the VR headset on and how that affects the develop, their physical development of their eyes. But there's also how they're learning to interact with reality and the things they can do in reality and try and see you know, ha if, they, if they jump, learning how high they can jump. Um, and so just getting that feedback from the real world and still learning about their environment and the things they can do in it. And so those are, those are the things you kind of have to ask yourself, well, how does VR impact children as they're still developing? Um, and with VR, like spending a long time in VR, you get sort of a, I call it like VR drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so our VR game for, for the toothbrushing game is only 90 seconds long. It's a really short experience. So they aren't in there in an extended period of time. And just to, to circle back, because I wasn't sure how much, where, where to draw the line between the two of us. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, for our, our augmented reality game, we actually spent a lot of time with a child psychologist understanding how they would perceive the world. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not a luxury. We, we, we self-funded our VR game, so we weren't able to afford that kind of expertise. So we were kind of muddling through that. That's interesting, Stephanie. You talk about the uh, effect on vision. Um, and the VR drunkenness, our QA team would probably uh, agree with you because our, our simulations are much, much longer. Guys are in there for uh, you know 90 minutes running through entire scenarios. So, um, but as far as um, you know where we're at and the demographic we're looking at targeting, um, back in the original uh, foundation of motion reality, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, who's our CEO, was a uh, biomechanist and he was a power lifter. And he had, uh, you know, Dr. Nels Madsen come in and work with them, and, and they figured out a way to do the motion capture so that they could predict and, and study and do things with the motion of the body. And that kind of, there was a demographic there for a while in sports performance, so that's still something that we do. Um, so virtual reality can have some tremendous uh, latitude, if you will, and, and effectiveness in approaching a sports performance market as well. Um, but in addition to that, like I said, our primary revenue stream currently is with the military and law enforcement. So uh, that's both foreign and domestic. Obviously, we're targeting allies if it's uh, foreign. Um, in fact, most of our sales are international. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stories. A lot of folks come through our place, testing out the system. You know, we deploy, and there's all sorts of uh, folks and interesting tactics and techniques and. There's all sorts of uh, ethical considerations we can get into here about some of that, but uh, like I said, we're trying to get in with the entertainment space now, so that's gonna range uh, about as broad as we could possibly get it, to be honest. All right, so this brings up an interesting question I wanna throw out to the audience. How many of you have experience with VR? How many have at least tried VR at some point? Excellent, well, great, great. How many own a VR headset of some type? About half of that. Excellent. Uh, and uh, how many have had more than like three to five VR experience? Have played three to five VR? Excellent. All right. Good. So a pretty broad range here. Part of the reason I want to bring that up is I do want to get now into the idea of what happens to the folks using uh, your tool. So Sean, I want to throw it right back at you. Um, 
uh, because you do have this deep immersive experience. And in fact, he didn't talk about what I consider the most immersive part, which is the electrocution that's a part of the game. So Yeah, yeah, that's one of the options. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, a lot of the military units uh, mandate that you wear it. You have these uh, optional muscle stimulation pads that you can hook up so that when you're shot and, and uh, you feel it, you definitely see the reaction. Um, people become much more engaged <laughs> and, Don't uh, we all with the capital? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no slacking off in this uh, system, but you know, that's that's definitely uh, one of the things that adds to the immersion, if you will. So I want to hold the, hold it with you, and then we'll come down the line with this question. Uh, you've all done testing on a lot of different types of people with your products. What sort of reactions have you seen that have either caused concerns for you to address later, or you have found particularly satisfying? Um, okay, it's uh, both a concern. This first one's both a concern uh, and a satisfaction. Um, the concern is that you see folks out there, like I said, you're in a basically a warehouse, an empty warehouse with virtual reality gear on, um, and people, as they're maneuvering through, like I said, especially if you have the muscle stimulation pads on, you're completely immersed in the moment, so you might think that that wall is something that you can lean on and get a little bit of an angle and peer behind, uh, you know, around a corner or something that somebody, somebody would fall over. Uh, so it's concerning that their physical security and their, their body might become damaged, but it's a tremendous uh, satisfaction for us as developers that it works. It's, you're completely immersed. Um, so I guess another thing is that um, I'm kind of concerned about, I don't know if we want to get into this now, but uh, the training, one of the things that I find that's it's now a possibility, especially in the realm of uh, first person shooters, if you will, whether it's simulation and training or entertainment, um, in VR, especially in the VR that we offer at Motion Reality, large scale, you're walking around being motion captured uh, there's this thing in training called muscle memory uh, you may have heard of but uh, and it doesn't matter what type of training you're doing it's just a thing that you're used to doing in fact my daughter uh, told me about this funny thing she did that she was drawing and then she was with her hand by hand you know she does a lot of uh, electronic drawing with Photoshop and uh, After Effects and whatnot and she had made a mistake, and her hand just went to do control C. <laughs> and it freaked her out. She's like, what is this? Um, but this muscle memory is, is a thing that um, that's one of the reasons why military and law enforcement people train so often. If you continue to do these motions in your training, when it comes time when the you know stuff hits the fan, you're going to have muscle memory. You're going to do these things. So I guess... What that brings me into now is when that comes into the public availability to go out and experience one of our things, even if it's a location-based entertainment uh, experience that has that type of thing that, you know, there's a certain percentage of the population um, that has, I'll just say, mental problems. And, you know, you've heard about shootings and things like that. So there's an ethical consideration when you provide that type of experience to someone, now, you know, you, it's, it's a totally different thing than just, you know, cooking up an idea in your head. Now you have a place to go train, build up that muscle memory. So it's a thing that I personally battle with and we have conversations about. And uh, I don't know what the right answer is, but I know it's, it's certainly a new thing that companies like uh, the one that I work for um, is now kind of making possible, but I guess my point of view on that whole thing is there's a certain percentage of the population they're going to be they're going to they're going to do what they're going to do no matter what we uh, provide them as developers. Idiots, no matter what. All right. Well, you're supposed to say I know the answer. If you stay to the end, we'll tell you what it is. Yeah. But well, that's I do exactly wanna, what I meant. Yeah. I do want to. <laughs> I do want to come <laughs> we, back. We, that, we actually I love give that. the answers. Uh, one word at a time at the end of every panel from now on. So go to the entire EFF track and put That's it together. Perfect. So Stephanie, on, on your end, concerns, rewards? So uh, I'll start with rewards. Is um, I think when I see people get into VR for the first time and they've never experienced it, 
uh, especially with Fresh Up. They just get they get blown away by the world and how how real it is, and it's it's really exciting for them. And then to see them really get into it. If you've ever watched someone like brushing giant teeth in midair, <laughs> <laughs> and they have no idea that everyone's watching them, it's really entertaining. But they really get into it and really get active, and just seeing that that reaction from them, just how into it they are. Um, that's that's definitely the positive, and that's how we kind of learned. Hey, we can do like physical exercise with this, and use that as a positive as well. Um, because afterwards, I'm like, man, my arms are tired. <laughs> I'm out of breath for 90 seconds. Um, that's the real reason it's only 90 seconds. Is, is our physical fitness. <laughs> 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 and then, I think as far as uh, like a potential negative, I guess, was when we were testing an early version of the more physical game was seeing sort of potential physical dangers for the people because you're in the in the virtual world so you don't really have your senses of the the real world that you're in um, and so we were we were throwing things at people and there were times that they wanted to step backwards but never felt comfortable stepping backwards and so we had to make adjustments in the game itself to cuz they to prevent them from getting into a situation where they then wanted to step backwards but felt really uncomfortable doing so because that became a scary thing for them. But we were able to, to use some of that fear to our advantage. So for instance, we, we define a play area uh, and we put you on a platform that in the sky that's that play area. So you are not going to want to jump off the edge. Um, and that way we can actually use that, those immersive um, feelings you have of, of uh, nervousness um, to, to corral your behavior where you want to be. The scariest thing I think I ever saw though was we had a woman from Vive come by, uh, the Vive of Angelica. Uh, Evan oh, Kathy? Kathy. She came by. Uh, she's the Evangelica. Was. Was. Evangelist. Evangelist. Thank you. I don't know why I can't pronounce that word. <laughs> For Atlanta, she came by to play our game and she was wearing high heels. And she, as soon as she had the, the VR headset on, she forgot she was wearing high heels, and she was trying to jump around in them, and we were convinced she was going to break her ankle. Um, I think she stopped after a particularly hard landing on those high heels. Um, as I mentioned before, we haven't done a lot of, of user testing on this, and so, we're the suckers. again, a plug. Tomorrow morning, up until about 2.30, and then I have to be back in this room for another panel. <laughs> so don't come at 2.30, come here for a different panel. Um, I, will, I will say that, that with uh, VR games in the nonprofit sector, we have seen uh, uh, a lot of these games that really try to push people's comfortability level. So Planned Parenthood, for example, has a VR experience where you're being driven to an abortion clinic interface with protesters. Uh, PETA has one where I think you're in a factory farm, which are all just like, these are horrible experiences, right? Um, ours is a little uncomfortable because you are in a, a police stop situation, but we are hoping that people come away from it uh, feeling more empowered about the world and less like, oh, this world is fucking terrible. So um, hopefully you can let us know whether we uh, are, are there yet. So. We don't have enough time for my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so the second uh, we started going into VR, to be totally honest, uh, I think as content creators, we've turned into something else. And uh, what we've turned into is we have more responsibility. Um, the responsibility we have to the users is the most important thing we can do as VR content creators. I think there's a point that we need to take a stand as content creators, every single one of us and anyone who actually gets into this, uh, to study what actually happens to the mind. Uh, one of the things, and it was the first scary thing that uh, happened to me, was we were at Coca-Cola, and it was only scary because we almost lost a job. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't warn the person or ask them if they were scared of heights. And what we did is it's a ghost story, and the ghost brings you up five stories uh, above a castle and then drops you. I think that scene is awesome. <laughs> After being cursed out <laughs> and asked why the hell would I do that to him, it set me off on this kind of research uh, cycle of what did we just build? How much power do we actually possess now? Because I don't want anybody to have an experience like that. So we went into really going and saying, everything we build, we have to concentrate. Are we hurting somebody? 
the worst thing that has ever happened um, is this scene that's up on the screen. I don't think that scene is a big deal. Um, we did a showing of a board game that we're working on, it's Chimera's Rift, and we showed it to 400 people. Our goal and our intent was to make everybody happy. I'm gonna stop this because I feel weird leaning into it. So can everybody hear me back there? Well, this is also for the recording, oh. so you do so this have to all right. into all right. it. Here, here. Thank you. All right. Can we kill the lights in back, uh, please? They're in the front. I thought they're. Does in back. anybody have the light switches? Okay. So it's, it's a, a dark scene anyway. Okay. It's hard. No, you can see it now. So you notice this robot is talking to this other little robot, and he's basically saying to this robot, "Give me that battery, because I need to save the world." That's a reason to talk to another robot, right? Um, the woman came up to me and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, sure. And I'm thinking, I have just been told for four days how amazing um, the VR is that we've created. I'm just, I need some more ego padding. Yeah, <laughs> give me, tell me about how much you loved it. And she said, why is there no warning? And I said, what do you mean? She said, there's no warning that the material that's going to be seen might induce repressed memories. Okay. I do not know what the repressed memory is. You could leave it up to yourselves to try and figure out what that means. But I had to talk to her for an hour. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. I sat there and I knew right then and there I could not tell her to go away. That I would, if she wanted to, I would spend eight hours, hell, I'd buy her a cup of coffee. Um, and we'd talk through this and we'd get to the other side of this because I realized at that, po at that moment that I did something that I did not intend to do. And that, as a creator of any type of content, is not what I want to be. Um, so, flash forward a little bit further, and we uh, did, took a trip to Vegas. Um, and we went into a VR uh, experience that's actually the backpack in the warehouse. It was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced, because I didn't realize how your mind could be fooled and, you know, you're talking about this thing with the cloud. You need to do more research. Um, that's scary. That's scary for a kid because I remember being on a ledge and actually having fear of not walking off the ledge. And the PTSDs and the reactions, that's real too. I've never felt something so real as what was happening. And I knew we were building VR. And I'm telling myself the whole time, this helicopter is not going down. Why am I shifting my weight? This is important. This is important stuff that we're doing. Um, and there is that muscle memory from it. So this is what happened to me. Talking about the repressed memories. Uh, we did a haunted uh, VR experience, which again was amazing. But at the end of it, you're in this wheelchair and it's a haunted house and they put you in this uh, canister. And I'm like, the whole time I'm having a good time. And then I hear the water. And I'm like, you sons of bitches. <laughs> I am deathly afraid of drowning. And I said everything in my mind, this is not real, this is not real, but you're gonna, you're gonna do this whole thing because everything was take off the glasses. When the water got up to my chin was when I realized I was holding my breath. And when the water went over, I realized, oh, I gotta breathe because I'm gonna pass out. <laughs> and I knew it was VR the whole entire time. There was that no time that I thought it was real, but my body, refused to believe it wasn't. The only thing that snapped me out of it is when the water came up and a mermaid came and I go, oh, that mermaid's fake. That's not good graphics. <laughs> and I was fine. But it was amazing because I really thought about it. Why is that? Um, so for us, we've done some really cool stuff. We've done some stuff, some aha moments that I've seen people, their jaws drop, um, they get excited and we ask them, you know, were you scared? And they say, like, no, I was anxious and this was awesome. Um, but there is a couple of people that are going to be affected differently and we really, we just need to think about that. So I love VR and I love everything that, that's about it, but if you do have this one moment, even if it's one person, I told this to one of our VR designers the other day, if one person complains, you got to think of them as a percentage of a million people. And is that a hundred thousand people that you just affected negatively? So. Um,
that got too deep, and I'm sorry. Actually, my last question was going to be the uh, what is the de developer's responsibility to the audience, and of course, you and Sean go and mess that up and start answering it early, <laughs> going deep on us, and I'm still trying to keep it all no, I didn't light for a that. while. <laughs> So that will be our last question. So you now have another 15 minutes to think about that one. <laughs> but I did want to touch on two other areas that I don't think are... Can Should we bring the lights back up? Then people have to look at me. <laughs> yeah, sure. Lights back up. I'm just up. thinking about your camera. I'm pretty sure people get to look at me regardless. But <laughs> <laughs> look you in the eyes. Anyway, uh, so I did want to touch on two areas, and then we we're going to go into the really deep philosophical... Uh, uh, yeah, gibberish area. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the issues that uh, all developers now have to deal with is what are you tracking, what kind of metrics are you keeping, how much are you imp getting into what your users are up to. And VR and AR give us a whole new level of tracking what users do. Uh, we see what they're looking at, we see what they focus at, it's not just what keys do they hit, it's what, what is actually practically going on in their mind. You get so much deeper into it. Uh, what do you track and what do you think the limit should be, if any, because obviously this data is incredibly valuable for developers to get for, for just making the game better. Uh, anyone want to jump on that one? I've been going back. All right, Sean, back to the excellent. <laughs> All right, okay, so um, as far as what we track uh, currently, it's, so we don't keep anybody's personal information, right? It's up to you if, you know, as a, as a participant, whether or not you want to give a name or whatever, just so we can identify who the participants are. And generally speaking, military and law enforcement guys, they want to put it or they have to so that they can uh, track and, and, and watch the thing at the end. So when I say watch the thing at the end, we track every movement. We track everything front to back. Um, so all the movement, what you were doing, what you were looking at, how your weapon was configured, like there's different buttons and options and things that you can do, um, you know, how your finger was oriented and whatnot. So we, we capture all of that in, in that product, Dauntless, and the, the real benefit for, for them is after the fact, they can come down, their sergeant, or just them themselves trying to become a better soldier uh, or a law enforcement officer is to see exactly where the threats were. What was I doing? How did I walk? Did I approach this the right way like I was supposed to? And then go back through the next time and get better every time, every time. Um, so as far as, uh, you know, what our, what, what the limit should be for law enforcement, that's what they wanted. That's why we created it. So when we bring that into the public limelight, I think that kind of crosses over into another thing that I didn't really mention that we do, which is motion capture services for the film industry and for games, uh, for characters in games, but motion capture for film. Uh, so one of the things, I don't know if you guys have been following on some of the advancements uh, in the motion capture, both facial and whole performance captures, um, there's deep machine learning that can look at that data, all that motion capture data, and say, okay, I've got Brad Pitt. Anytime we need Brad Pitt, we can just conjure him up and how he moves and his gait, his meter, his facial expressions, and, and, and project onto him things that he never even said or did. Uh, and I think that is a tremendous ethical concern, and that's where you know, I would draw the line personally is not to really go down that without some pretty big contracts but uh, you know, for Brad Pitt in this case, <laughs> to understand what you know what what you're getting into there. But um, so for us, it's just a one-time thing. You know, we want to try to detach that personal uh, nature to it. Don't don't go crazy with your machine learning unless it somehow enhances that one particular aspect. And then when that product is done, you tie a bow on it, and that's that's a finished thing. You you have to desensitize, if you will, take out the personally, identifi uh, personally identifiable information out of it um, so that it can't be used without that person's permission. Yeah, you said some of what I was thinking about as well. Um, yeah, first of all, considering what is personally identifiable information and what isn't, and then also what are you tracking and not saving, and then what are you keeping long term, and among both of these how are you communicating that to 
the person who's in the VR set because if they don't know you're tracking the stuff and especially if they don't know you're storing any of this data that's that's really bad and really scary um, I do know Jesse knows more about the data that gets yeah. tracked than I do because <laughs> that's kind of his wheelhouse uh, one of the things in particular that we had to look at in order to make the game personal for the person is the height of the person because we're sending we're sending things at the person and in fact this was a problem with uh, the toothbrush game was that we made it for kids and so for adults the character was too short <laughs> <laughs> um, but so for the second game we looked at the person's height and adjusted the game based on that height and I, I don't think we were saving that height we, we were okay <laughs> See, I, I don't know what we I don't know what we save um, but well well no but to, to what you were saying is that being able to see the intricacies of a person's m motion that becomes personally identifiable um, and then the other thing to think about is that certain things in a person's motion can give information about physical disabilities or physical injuries that that person has and that goes into what if insurance companies get that right sure yeah. those are just things i've thought about mm -hmm. <laughs> not necessarily related to our games but so so for our second game where, where we were tracking children's or people's heights uh we did keep track of their height we kept track of the, their head motions throughout the course of the game we kept track of that completely separate from any individual person uh, and this game has not been released publicly uh, and we've been using it in more of an expo style setting so I mean I guess theoretically if we could figure out which person what order people came to our booths we would be able to de-anonymize the data um, but all in all the height data is not specific enough usually there's a variance in how people stand when, when we take that data um, how, how straight they're standing uh, and we, we, the reason we're keeping that is mostly for development reasons. You know, for instance, we have an auto-scaling system for height. Is it working? Well, the only way we know that is if we can start, you know, correlating scores to people's heights and seeing if that works. Um, for our released game, which is the Brush Up uh, VR on Steam and non-VR versions are on other things, um, we keep track of things for Steam. Um, achievements and everyone knows we're tracking those because we give them a list of achievements they can earn uh, so for there we're tracking things like you know which teeth did you manage to brush did you brush all the teeth just the inner teeth just the outer teeth um, the biting surfaces uh, and so there it's much more about you know that's the kind of tracking that everyone would expect within a video game we're tracking the game mechanics there though. We're, we're tracking the game mechanics there we're not tracking any individual VR specific things So the question is for the biometric data that they're keeping, is there a plan for when that will get deleted? That is an excellent question. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, we, we should have an answer for that. Um, honestly, we, have su we had such a bad plan for how we were going to use the data that, that that never even came to it. The answer was going to be after we figured out how we figured out trying to get figured out how to get an answer to these questions. Uh, we don't see a reason to keep it around forever, but um, we Honestly, it's been almost five months now, and we have yet to figure out how to get the answers to, is height really impacting uh, gameplay? That might be it, not having enough data. It might not be us being good enough data scientists. Um, but you're, you're right. Like, for instance, uh, gate tracking and identifying people via gate is something Georgia Tech does a lot of work with. Uh, I don't know anything about that, but I do know that they're experts. All right, Dave, I want to know what the EFF is tracking in their games. <laughs> well, I, I first want to say that, like Stephanie, I'm very concerned about the potential for VR to capture both physical and behavioral biometrics. And, uh, you know, we had a meeting with, with Facebook a couple years ago to ask them all sorts of questions about what the Oculus was collecting, what their plans were for it. It seemed they had not figured out how they were going to monetize the Oculus at that point, and I had to silence myself after a few minutes because I realized I was giving them ideas in expressing <laughs> my concerns. 
Um, You're the reason. Yeah, but but as far as as far as our project, our project is uh, a web VR thing, so it lives on the open or it will live on the open web, and therefore it has to comply to our privacy policy and as well as the various privacy policies like GDPR, you know, for you know overseas people, as well as you know California's new law that's coming up and all sorts of things. Uh, we don't really track anything related to it, except maybe like an IP address that's going to hit it. Um, and even then, we have very strict controls about what we what we do with that. But it's a very simple game, so there isn't necessarily like a lot in it to 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 really track. They're tracking your brain waves. Well, I don't know. We had a, we had a, a Hololens demo for that um, at our office for the. Um, it's the playoff of the next generation, the game thing, you know, where Riker and everybody else gets addicted to this game. And I think that actually plays like has like a brain sensor to it, and uh, that you relax and the little ball goes in the thing. Um, but that was really scary. Like it was scary, I, cool but scary. I, I played the game where you relax and the ball because yeah. actually that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, interesting. I don't think it's a very good brain sensor, but the idea that I've actually seen several iterations of that. Um, and every year I try it out again, yeah. and every year it gets a little bit better. Yeah, I've done the rocket ship one, yeah, exactly. All right, Dean. So um, our crew isn't that smart that you have to worry about our tracking. I think this is on. I'm still on. <laughs> um, we're, we're artists and designers. We don't know how to program a thing. <laughs> um, we don't know how to record anything. <laughs> it just puts it out there. Uh, one of the things, though, here, go and use this one, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we're actually doing, and this is really weird, um, our main job is promotions, marketing, commercials, advertising, and our clients want to track you. Um, we have not gotten into that space yet, but every single client that has come to us wants an ROI. Every single client wants to know where you're looking, how long you're looking, uh, and why you're looking there. Uh, we haven't run into that where someone has forced our hand on that. I don't know what I'll do. I'll be totally honest. Uh, at that point, if the dollar sign is enough, I'll be totally honest. I need to keep my studio open. Uh, so it will be interesting. I can't say I wouldn't. I can't say I would. My def definition of ethics is in so far as that, if I can make the product better by knowing where you're looking, then I can make the product better. Meaning VR is about navigation, right? So the problem we have to making a perfect, a perfect VR experience is telling this story and where you're looking. If I can ensure that you're looking where I want you to look, that's the only information I want. I don't need to know you, I don't need anything else. I just need to know, we made a panda in the woods and you looked at the panda as opposed to just looking at the woods because that makes it a better game. Um, we personally do not know how to do that. Um, the way I feel about ethics is I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want anybody to feel that they have been spied on. I don't want any of that. So if it's something that I would allow, like I want you to know where I look in VR. I want you to make a better game. I want you to make a better experience. Uh, I don't need to type my name in. Uh, you don't need to know where I am. Uh, but you do need to know where I look so that you can work on your navigation because the hardest thing in VR is to get anybody to look where, they, where you want them to do. As far as ethics, um, I don't know my, my, uh, the definition in so far as anything more than I don't want you to feel pain and I don't want you not to trust me. So that's the only way I can create the things I want to create. I don't know if that's the right answer. But, but there's a giant difference between I'm collecting data on where you're looking in the development phase, among beta testers or among people who know they're on an expo floor and there's video cameras everywhere and, and everyone's kind of consenting to this, or people who are at home experiencing something in the privacy of their home where they're not used to being tracked. And especially, even though people have become more and more used to being tracked on the computer, which we can get into whether or not that's a good thing, um, they, their physical actions they still don't think are of being tracked. Um, I, I also want to add, with when it comes to augmented reality, we've been talking about virtual reality and the way the technology looks in at you. Uh, with augmented reality, there is a whole other element of how the technology is looking outworld at the world and what it's collecting as you're going around and using it to look at environments or you know to scan people and whether that data is being collected and sent somewhere else as well. 
And before we throw it out to the crowd, let me get the one last question, which pretty much you've all now answered, which is what is the designer's ethical responsibility? And this is both pro and con. Ethical responsibility to make a good product for your, uh, for your audience and also to make a safe one. So anyone who hasn't already jumped on this want to go ahead and jump on it. If you have jumped on it and got more to say, say it. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> And absolute power is kind of neat. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in that? Right, right, I mean, this is this is not along the same lines, but for us, you know, we definitely uh, want to support open source projects, which is why we chose A-Frame as the language to write it in, as opposed to say Unity or, or Unreal or something like that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was cross-platform, uh, so that. It could be accessible to anyone, regardless of whether you had a phone or an HTC Vive. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that it didn't require you to have controllers or not, that you could do it just offline site. And so those were some of the design decisions we made based on our own ethos as an organization. Yeah, I just want to say about ethics, um, especially for indie size groups and small companies. I mean, Motion Reality is a small company still, um, around 30 folks. Um, but even smaller than that, indie folks, there's a lot of indie folks in the area, and they're, you know, when you talk about ethics, you gotta consider what, can you even have a business if you put what someone who's potentially extreme in their views of what's ethical and what's not, um, how much time are you gonna spend trying to account for all the ethical loopholes that exist and still make money with your product, right? So I think it, it, from my point of view is keep it all in mind. Try to be reasonable about it. Don't be blatantly negligent in something and, yeah, collect all this data, put it on an unsecure server that anybody could hack. Um, you know, keep it, you know, delete it if, it, if it's absolutely uh, unnecessary uh, and keep it if the client says they want it or, you know, anonymize it. Just do what you can in the limits of actually still being able to make money and don't be blatantly, grossly unethical about something. That's about the way and I that's see it. That's a perfect note to throw it over to the audience. All right, red meat out there, go. <laughs> oh, wow, one or two hands up. <laughs> Lots of hands up for those of you watching. Just talk? Okay, cool. Um, so my question is, we you've talked a lot about uh, the psychological effects on, um, on people such as like PTSD and things that are triggering. Um, my question is, is anyone studying and what are the results? If so, um, the psychological effects of actually using VR games and playing VR games, such as like young children, um, the, the two things I think of most are, are young children and their ability to differentiate between reality and the game. And if, if that line, blurring that line at a young age is a problem. And the other thing I'm thinking of is, as, especially as VR comes into the home space and people are not being you know, surveilled as they're playing, um, what what are the effects of giving civilians realistic first-person shooter games, realistic surveillance games? What are we doing by giving civilians that kind of perceived power, that kind of perceived ability? Uh, you know, is how realistic are the games? You know, is someone going to play a first-person shooter and think like, oh, I know how to operate a firearm now if they're good at the first-person yeah, shooter? And and so that's those are my kind of two thoughts on that. Yeah, realm. let me since there's a first-person shooter kind of vibe there, um, I'll, I'll try to address that. One of the things I didn't mention before that I was talking about muscle memory and you know what what do you do to not kind of put that power in the hands of an everyday civilian? Well, we're not quite there yet, but we are thinking about it. And and one of the things um, that we're doing is for the entertainment space going out into the public arena, you don't give them a realistic weapon, first of all. Um, you give them something, we created this electronic pistol that operates a lot like the old arcade, you know, Time Cop or whatever, in Time Crisis, and you're just smacking the bottom. Uh, you don't want to, there, there's multiple reasons for that, but one of them certainly is ethical, where you don't want to have, you know, that exact capability, not exact capability, but, um, you know, manipulation of a firearm, right? So, so that's one thing that we do is dumb that down, simplify it. Um, but yeah, there's... Uh, 
And that's why my question is almost like the perceived ability, because there's the effort to right. to dumb it down so you're not perceived. Getting the that's skills, true. But the perception. That's why I think it's great to have the age limit, right? I mean, especially for a game like this in a uh, motion captured, fully free environment like that. Absolutely, uh, age limit should be a little bit higher, and. Um, you know, we're not going to be providing the same level of uh, experience, right? There's going to be a lot more playful things that are obviously, uh, we talked about how things obviously broke the immersion. There's a mermaid. Well, there's going to be stuff in these entertainment games that should be obvious, but I think your question is quite valid, and it's going to be something that we have to experiment with. So, I think Dean wanted want to, to show something as, uh, as we move uh, forward on this one. Yeah. So, so here's one of the things when I said that uh, conversation with that woman sent me off onto this uh, wild research uh, situation. Um, I had heard this term before and I didn't really understand exactly what it meant and it's called a lizard brain. And what it means is it's your limbic cortex. And what the limbic cortex is meant for is for survival. Um, your, your reasoning and your logic, uh, most of us think that we can reason and logic through anything, but we don't understand that the limbic cortex comes in to save us. Uh, that's its purpose. The problem with that is it's got some major things that it controls. Okay? Sorry for the last one to some of you. <laughs> but but as been told it's after ten. So here's the thing. Um, these are permanencies. These are not things you unlogic. These are permanencies. Um, this is something that is always with you and will always be, th be with you. This is why we like to fight. This is why we like violence. It is inbred into our brains. So the limbic cortex puts a permanent memory for all of these things. Um, it is also addiction. So the problem is we have this VR situation where we're hardwiring information into our uh, heads with no distractions. VR is a place that has no distractions. Think about that for a second. I can hear the sound. I can see the eyes. Andrew's trying to rub closer to me. <laughs> All of these things are happening. After 10. <laughs> and, <I'm s> <laughs> and she just put up five minutes. So all of this is keeping me in this weird kind of not here, here state. Remember about the mermaid, it took me out of that situation. Uh, and you're right. There should be things that are not real. Um, but... All of those things that occur are natural. They, they're here. You can't override them. Why am I afraid that I'm going to drown when there's no possible way that I'm going to drown? Because I'm alone at that moment. There is no one to talk to. There is nothing to see. Uh, one of the things that we did because of our fear of this, which is really funny, um, we went and explored glasses that had open sides uh, after this so that you're always here and there. Um, and that's something that you, that you have to look like research. You have to think about these things. That is a great question. That's an interesting thing that you say because I'm thinking when I've played VR games and gotten that moment where I'm a little afraid, I'll reach out and ask the person in the room with me to grab my hand so I like, know I'm safe and physically in the room. Yeah. So, you can, yourself, so you, can you can pull yourself out. I went to an experience where my <laughs> business partner tapped the whole time because he refused to be swallowed into this world. Uh, we all take those worlds differently. Some of us uh, don't get affected. I have a vivid imagination. It's really easy for me to fall into this new reality and for m it to feel real to me. So it does affect people completely differently. Hey, Dean, well, let me just say this real quick, Dean, about that. Uh, <laughs> my CEO would want me to say this and back up what you're saying. He put a tremendous amount of uh, um, research into just that, being able to see part of the re real world while you have a headset on. So I, I want to second that. Dr. McLaughlin, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more question, I think we have one time. One okay, question. I got the box. So Last question, I'm uh, sorry, we'll hang out a little bit. Oh, very much appreciate you guys being sensitive to how these things would affect kids. Thank, please keep that up. My question is the other end of the spectrum, being on the end of the baby boomer, right? A lot of us are dealing with aging parents. And I was wondering, and I have very little to hardly any experience with VR, so forgive me if this is an ignorant question, but has there been any work done on how to use this for the elderly at whatever various stages? Um, and in particular, um, you know, I, I don't know, any safety or ethics issues 
And if there has been, or if there's something out there uh, for someone that's still, say, of sound mind and body, but just getting older, not moving as quickly, what platform, what do you, I've only like tried Oculus Rift once in Best Buy when my son said, here, mom, try this. So I don't even know like what you would buy. But my main thing is about the elderly. Have you looked at that? I know specifically uh, one of the things that is being done with elderly and VR is that a, a lot of times when people get older, they can't go places as well. And so VR is being used to let, let them like travel basically in their mind when maybe they're, they're just still in a room. Um, and I've also, for that specific uh, situation, I've, I've heard a good and a bad for it. So that's, that's like the, the good benefit, the beneficial part of being able to do that. But on the negative side of that is you have to consider if someone gets used to just doing that, do they stop going out in the real world? Do they just kind of get addicted to going to these places? Um, and the other thing that might be really useful for someone who's elderly, like especially if they have a lot of arth arthritis pain or something, is that VR is being used to treat people with pain. Specifically, uh, burn victims are used, uh, VR is used for them, uh, they're put in a really snowy place and the amount that it removes their pain is comparable to opioids. In other pain areas as well, there's some amazing research going on. I know folks who are got products going for the FDA right now is digital medicine because of the amazing abilities you can use. And pain is one. Addiction is another one that they're looking to treat. Uh, yeah. So all the manufacturers, well, I have heard from some manufacturer reps that the older population is a target demographic. They've got the money. They've got the time. This should be a perfect one for them. I don't know how far they've gone in trying to penetrate that market so far, but I know it is a target for them. But as for the research, the, yeah, there's a group of from Buffalo. They're they're trying to fight through the AD, the uh, FDA approval process right now. But obviously, they're not going to put anything on the market until they hear one way or the other. Until the insurance companies can cover it. <laughs> until it's that is a really medicine. hard thing to do, uh, not to crack. Um, I, I listened to them complain for literally an hour uh, about a month ago about getting people to do non-standard um, treatments. And as a company that was trying to get dental car insurance carriers to cover, we will produce less cavities in your kids. Here's the scientifically validated studies that will prove it. Um, they are it's remarkably resilient to something that you would think would be a no-brainer. Uh, and on that, we get to complain about insurance companies and end the session. So thank you all very much. And if you like it, remember to rate us on the app. Please rate us on the app.